Hello, everybody. Welcome to Women in the Word. My name's Amy Foster. I love being here with you today. I, I don't know about you, I have loved the study in Matthew, and I think part of the reason I like it, I'm kind of intrigued with um, the way Matthew uses words. He does really subtle things over and over and over again to tell us, I'm shifting the story now, I'm shifting the emphasis, and the, the subtle thing, or maybe it wasn't so subtle that he does in these two chapters we're looking at today is, behold, behold, behold. Did you notice 10 times in these two chapters he's using the word behold? And so as I was studying it, I thought, I, I got to figure out what he's doing with that. I, I looked it up. Mr. Webster says, behold is to fix your eyes upon, to observe with care. And that's a good definition. It's, it's modern. I don't think it fully communicates what Matthew's trying to do when he uses the word behold here. You know, just a few weeks ago, we were thick in the holidays, and, and I had several family members home with me for a couple of weeks, and it's important for you to know that all my family members are of the male species, and I found myself understanding behold and wanting to use it. I wanted to say, behold, empty soda cans on the coffee table, <laughs> behold, stinky sneakers on the living room floor. And my favorite, behold, clean dishes in the dishwasher. Now, every one of you has a better understanding of the word behold now, don't you? It doesn't just mean observe. There's a call to action in the word behold. In my house, it means unload the dishwasher and pick up the soda cans. I think Matthew's doing the same thing here. He's... Um, He's wanting the, the nation of Israel to behold, and you see at this point, Jesus has already, he's been presented to the nation as their long-awaited king, and Matthew has showed us that his, his lineage, his heritage, his arrival, it all perfectly fulfills the prophecy. Matthew's told us that his teaching comes with power and authority. It's like Matthew saying, the proclamation has been made, behold, Israel, your king is here. And now you must decide. All of Israel needs to determine how they would respond to the presentation of the king. And Matthew writes with one purpose. He wants the Jewish people to receive their king. He wants them to follow Jesus in faith. So what Matthew's doing right now in these two chapters, he has grouped together some specific events from Jesus' life. These are real events that actually happened. They're miracles. Now, they don't happen chronologically. If you're looking at these events in some of the other Gospels, the order will be a little bit different. Matthew has kind of grouped them by theme so that we could see them as evidence that they testify to Jesus' authority. Now, we're going to talk about these miracles today, so let's define miracles. A miracle is an event that cannot be explained by coincidence. It cannot be explained um, as a response of natural laws. A miracle in, is an event when God intervenes and he supersedes nature's laws and does something that we can't do on our own. Now, in, if you read these chapters, you might be inclined to think miracles happen every day and sometimes multiple times a day. That's not really true. Um, God uses miracles in a targeted way. Um, God uses miracles both um, a, as a sign, that this is a sign coming to you from God. God uses miracles a, as a witness. It, it's God saying, I'm a witness to this. You need to listen. And God always uses miracles to validate or authenticate both the message and the messenger. And he doesn't do miracles all the time. If you look at the whole of the Bible, there are really four periods in history when God has used miracles significantly like this. He first used miracles when he called on Moses to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt and lead them into the promised land. Then he used miracles roughly 800 years later when he had the prophets Elijah and Elisha, and they were to call those Israelites back into a proper relationship with God. And then a long period goes by, seven or 800 more years, and he begins using miracles when Jesus arrives and is proclaiming the arrival of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And we know there's one more time when miracles come, as the apostles go and they're sharing the gospel and the church is growing, God also authenticates and validates their message and their ministry with miracles. So we're going to look at these miracles today. Matthew really groups them all together and sort of um, ties them together around this question, 
Who is this man? The disciples are going to ask that, and when we look at all the miracles together, each one answers the question, who is this man? This is also the point in Matthew's gospel when great opposition to Jesus begins. People have been opposing him since the moment he was born, but the opposition really increases now. We're going to see people aligning themselves in camp. We're going to have those who have faith. They believe, they submit, they follow Jesus. We're going to have those who oppose and don't believe and don't follow Jesus. And you might think, well, there's this little group in the middle too. There are these people who follow him around and marvel, but they don't follow him. And you need to understand real clearly there aren't three groups. Those groups fall, in, those people fall into the category of unbelief as well. And we know we still have those same groups today. So open your Bibles. Let's read this first miracle beginning in Matthew chapter 8. When Jesus came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And beheld, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them." So right away, we have a leper kneeling before Jesus, and I don't know if you noticed, he doesn't ask Jesus a question, he proclaims his faith. Lord, if you will, you can. And Jesus does two remarkable things in response here. First, he says, I will. And he communicates, he has a desire that this man would be healed and hold. And then second, he does something really remarkable. He reaches out and he touches an untouchable man. When we are reading in Matthew, we have to always understand he writes to a Jewish audience. That means um, there are Jewish customs and thoughts and traditions that he doesn't need to explain because people just intuitively pick those up right away. But we're not a Jewish audience, so we're going to spend some time understanding these things. Leprosy in the ancient world was a detestable skin disease with no cure. It was considered contagious, and it was also regarded spiritually as a curse. It made the person um, terminal ill, but also ceremonially unclean, which meant that they were not allowed to participate in any kind of worship in the synagogue. They weren't allowed to have um, contact with other people. So you weren't just terminally ill, you were socially isolated. And any Jew who came into contact with a person with leprosy, they were also defiled. They were also unclean for a period of time. So Jesus is violating all the traditions and practices of the day when he reaches out and he touches this leprous man. He's touching the untouchable, and we know Jesus could have healed him with a word because he does that other times, but not this time. He uses his touch. And he's demonstrating two things. He's demonstrating he has power over this disease, and we see that because the leper is immediately healed. But he's also demonstrating great compassion as he touches this man who no one will get near and touch. He's not just healing his body. He's making a way for this man to reenter life and community and fellowship and corporate worship with others. And then Jesus does something really interesting. He says, go show yourself to the priest. And here's what a Jew would have understood about this. Um, They were so cautious and careful about the spread of leprosy at this time that they had specific practices and even laws that a person who had a symptom of leprosy or a person who'd been exposed to leprosy, they had to present themselves to a priest. The priest had to inspect them. These inspections would be stretched out over a significant period of time like an incubation. And only when the priest certified that you did not have leprosy could you re-enter life with the community. Since the prophet Elisha, some 800 years before, no one had ever been healed of leprosy. So by sending this man to the priest, Jesus is sort of saying, behold, priest, take a look at this man. And the priest would have to certify the man has no sign of leprosy. The priest the man has been miraculously healed. That's why Jesus is sending him to the priest here. Let's read the next miracle. It begins in verse 5. 
When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home and suffering terribly. And Jesus said, I'll come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, I say, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled, and he said to those who followed him, Truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed." And the servant was healed at that very moment. So when we read centurion here, uh, we think that's a military person. A Jewish person reading centurion is immediately going to think that's a Gentile. That's a Gentile. He was a Roman officer, and he had charge over 100 men. And he was a Gentile separate from the Jews. You need to know a Gentile was also considered unclean, just like a leper. You also need to know a devout Jew would not associate with a Gentile and definitely would never go into a Gentile person's home. But this was no average Gentile. He was one who's possessing and demonstrating great faith here. And his faith is marveled at by Jesus. When he offers to go to this unclean Gentile's home, Jesus uh, knows this would render him ceremonially unclean, defiled once again. But the centurion responds, oh no, Lord, only say the word. He knows Jesus' power is so great that he doesn't need to be present to heal this uh, man. He knows that Jesus can only say the word. And then he goes on to explain something pretty remarkable. This centurion really understands the chain of command. And he understands it because he is a part of a chain of command. And so he starts talking about, there are men under me who will follow my order. And they will do, do exactly as he says. But here's what's not so clear. These men follow the centurion's order because the centurion is also part of a chain of command. And he doesn't speak for himself. He speaks for the emperor. So what the centurion is really saying here is I recognize that Jesus, too, is part of a chain of command. This Gentile officer of Rome is recognizing Jesus speaks for God. Jesus speaks with the authority of God. That's why his words have such power. Jesus would later confirm this on your verse sheet, Matthew 28, 18. Jesus says, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. And he says in John 5, 19, Truly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. This is the only incident when we have recorded that Jesus marvels at someone's faith. And it's interesting that he's marveling at the faith of someone who is outside the family of God and Israel. So Jesus uses this opportunity to teach a new truth when he says, many will come from east and west and recline at the table. The table has always been um, something that illustrates fellowship with God. The Jews understood they had been invited to a feast to sit around God's table, and they were invited because God had made that covenant with them and made them his chosen people. But now Jesus is saying, many others will come also. They'll come to the table. They'll be welcome to have fellowship with God. Um, and he also makes the sad reference here, there will be some sons of Israel who will no longer be welcomed at the table. They will be cast out. So Jesus is really telling them that things are changing. Gentiles will be welcomed into fellowship with God. Entrance into God's kingdom would not come from your national heritage or your ethnicity, but it would come from faith, the exact kind of faith that this Gentile is demonstrating here. So simply with his word, Jesus heals the servant, as you have believed, is what he says. And he's, he's really letting us know that this Gentile's faith had invited the miracle of God to happen here. And next, it says he, he goes next into Peter's home. Peter is one of his followers. And Jesus is made aware that Peter's mother-in-law is lying ill with a fever. And it's just explained so quickly, Jesus just touches her. 
It just sounds like such a gentle, easy touch from Jesus that communicates profound power. She's immediately healed. And just so that we understand how miraculous this is, she needs no time of recovery. She doesn't need a meal or a bowl of soup or a little rest. She jumps up and starts serving Jesus right away. All right, Matthew's put these three miracles together because he wants us to look at them together. He wants us to formulate some truths about who is this man. So when we see these three together, we see he has power over every human affliction. Power over disease and illness and leprosy and paralysis. They all respond to his touch and his command. But we see more than his power, we also see his compassion, don't we? His compassion is open to all who are hurting and isolated and outcast and in need. And you have to remember, if you were Jewish, a leper and a Gentile, they were defiled, they were untouchables, they were unclean. A woman was second rate. A person with a fever was to be despised and avoided. The religious leaders would have discouraged any contact with these people. There would have been some significant consequences to you for interacting with them. But not in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, untouchables would be embraced. The rejected would be visited and sought out. The contaminated and defiled would be touched and welcomed. You know, Psalm 72 is a psalm about the king of Israel, but many believe it's a psalm about the king, the Messiah. And it says, For he delivers the needy when he calls, the poor in him who has no helper. He has pity on the weak and the needy, and he saves their lives. So when we ask the question, who is he, looking at these three miracles, we have to say, He's one with great power. His power is so great it can overwhelm these diseases immediately. And his power is so great it completely protects him from these diseases. Because remember, Jesus did have a human body. But when the prophet said he could bear these diseases, he would be protected from them. But we also see his compassion is great. It compels him to reach out without shrinking back. So Matthew says, behold all of this because he wants a response from people. What would the appropriate response be when you see this man? The only appropriate response would be to trust him. Trust him, just like all the people in the miracles are trusting him. They're coming to Jesus with every need. And so that's a great reality for us, too. We can go to Jesus with every need, not just our physical needs. We go to him first with our spiritual need. He's the only one who can restore us to a right relationship with God. We go to him with our emotional needs, our hurts and our wounds and our hang-ups from the past. We go to him with our needs for provision and wisdom and understanding We go to Jesus, and ladies, we go to him first. If we trust him most, we go to him first. When we turn to other things first, we're giving them the trust that Jesus deserves, and we're turning those things into idols in our lives. I think we know we can trust him because in his power, we see he can overcome any obstacle in our life that needs to be overcome. In his compassion, we know that we can trust his answer and his outcome because we know he wants wholeness and health for us and healing in our soul. Trust this man is the only response. We're going to look at three more miracles now. Um, They're going to give us a bigger view also of Jesus' power, but they're really going to give us a view of Jesus' authority. Read with me in uh, 8.23. And when Jesus got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But Jesus was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, "'Save us, Lord, we are perishing.'" And he said to them, why are you afraid, O you of little faith? And then Jesus rose and rebuked the wind and the sea, and there was great calm, and the men marveled, saying, what sort of man is this? Even the winds and sea obey him. All right, they're they're crossing the sea, and I think the thing we have to understand, we have some seasoned fishermen on the boat here. They've spent their life on this sea. You've probably heard it taught before that the geography of this area around the Sea of Galilee is is kind of unusual, and they call it a sea, but I've been there and seen it, and, and it looks like a lake. 
to me. So it's a very, very deep body of water. It's surrounded by hills and mountains at a high elevation. And then within those hills and mountains, there are some ravines. And the wind can move swiftly off the high elevation down to that deep, deep water. And it just makes this area very vulnerable to fear, fierce storms. But we know that some of these fishermen have ridden out these fierce storms before. Um, so we don't think they're surprised by it, but something was specific about this storm. It, it's called a great storm, and they're terrified. Uh, the, the water's coming into the boat. They're consumed with fear, but Jesus is not terrified. He's asleep, probably in the bottom, the floorboard of the boat, probably very near their feet. Jesus is sleeping through all of them. So they wake him up with a pretty succinct prayer, and I think you can look carefully at it, and you see both faith and fear. Save us, Lord, we're dying. We're all dying here. Jesus immediately addresses their fear, not the storm. And one, one translation says he rebukes them for their small faith or little faith. Now, small faith is something Matthew is going to refer to several times in the rest of his book, and it really means diminished faith. It means um, a lack of fully trusting in God. It's belief, but not fully trusting that's what they're experiencing. Um, I think probably they're looking at those storm clouds and they're looking at those giant waves and they're trying to bail that water out of the boat and all they can think about is those terrifying things. And as they focus on those things, their faith just does this. It gets smaller and smaller. It shrinks. And ladies, when our faith shrinks, our fear grows. That's true, isn't it? You know, I've actually experienced this in my own life just the last couple of weeks. I've been struggling a little bit with fear. This afternoon, I'm taking a family member to the airport, and he's going to go further away than he's ever been before, and he's going to be away from me for longer than we've ever been separated, and he's going to be doing some work that has a little risk involved. And for several weeks, I've focused on the distance and the time and the risk, and my faith has just shriveled more and more every single day, and fear has grown and just worked like a vice on my heart, and I'm so grateful I was studying these passages because I realized I'm just like the disciples. I've got to take my eyes off of those risky, fearful circumstances, and I've got to remember who rides in the boat with all of us because it's Jesus who's so powerful. I have to remember that he says, I'll never leave you or your loved one. I'll never forsake you or your loved one. I think the answer to our shrinking faith is putting our eyes and our hope and our trust back on Jesus. I've included Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 on your verse sheet. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. And then in all your ways, acknowledge him. And to me, this means don't acknowledge the storm and the waves and the risk, but acknowledge the Savior who's with you, and he will make your path straight. So Jesus stands up and he rebukes the storm. And that word rebuked, it's scolded. It's like he's scolding the naughty toddler who's out of control there with him. He scolds the storm and we instantly go from great storm to great calm. And these seasoned fishermen have never seen a storm end like that before. Don't you know their mouths were hanging open? Who is he? Who is this man? The sea and the wind listens to him. And I love that Matthew leaves that question just hanging in the air. Who is that man? And he takes us straight into the next miracle that answers the question. Pick back up with me in verse 28. And when Jesus came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him coming out of the tombs, so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a herd of many pigs was feeding at a distance from them, and the demons begged Jesus, saying, If you cast us out, send us into the pigs. And Jesus said, Go. So the demons came out and went into the pigs, and behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. The herdsmen fled, and going into the city, they told everything, especially what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region." 
All right, we don't have a lot of experience today with demonic possession, but it's re- referred to so often in the life of Jesus in Bible times. Here's what we know from the whole of the Bible. We know that Satan was a fallen angel who rebelled against God and was cast out of heaven, and we know he took other rebellious angelic beings with him, and we know that God has allowed them some freedom to work among men and on the earth for a period of time. We also know that the goal of Satan and these demons is always to oppose the work of God. And they will do that through deception and through destruction. So here we've got these two men who are possessed by demons, and it's manifested in superhuman strength. Some of the other gospel accounts tell us that they were so afraid of these men, they'd try to chain them up, and the men could break the chains. That's how they've terrified their community and intimidated people. So I want you to imagine this scene. Jesus and his disciples are pulling up on the shore, and it's as if as soon as they put their foot on dry land, these demon-possessed men come roaring and raging out of the tombs, the tombs where dead people are kept, and they are fighting and resisting the kingdom of God coming into their community because that's what demons do. They oppose the work of God. They immediately answer the question, who is this man? They call him the son of God. They know exactly who he is, but they don't want to line up with him They refer to a future time when they know God will no longer allow them freedom. They'll be permanently judged and punished. They know Jesus has total control. He can cast these demons wherever he wants. They know he is the all-powerful king. But please do not confuse that with faith. Knowledge of God and faith in God are distinct and different things, and we see that very clearly right here. They don't line up and submit with Jesus. They don't willingly enter his kingdom. They hate him, and they resist him, and they fight him. So showing his authority over Satan and the demonic world, Jesus cast them out with one word, go, and it's a powerful word. The demons, it's a curious thing. They enter this herd of pigs, and ladies, we don't know why it happens, but the pigs rush over a cliff and and drown in the water. It is certainly possible that that happens because demons are always bent on destruction. That is definitely a possibility. And all the people of the town come out, and they behold with their eyes and imagine what they see. Here sit the formerly demon-possessed men that they were terrified of and tried to chain up. Now they're sitting here clothed and reasonable in their right minds, experiencing great peace. And over here in the water, we've got drowned, dead pigs. And I'm sure to some people in that community, those pigs represented a loss of great income. They behold it with their eyes, and how do they respond? They beg Jesus to leave. Leave Jesus. Their eyes see it all, but they do not respond in faith. They're not doubting what just happened here. They're just not wanting to enter the kingdom of God and submit to the king. They want to command the king, leave Jesus. We don't want you in this place. It's a pretty sobering moment here. Again, we see knowledge of God and faith in God are different and distinct things. James reminds us of this, James 2.19. He says, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. No one was doubting what had happened, but no one was willing to submit to Jesus. This is really the main turning point in the Gospel of Matthew in terms of strong opposition to Jesus. It becomes stronger and more powerful now. Sadly, perhaps tragically, Jesus complies with their request. In the whole history of the Bible, there's no other recorded instant of Jesus going back to this area. There's no other great miracle done there. And I think we have to stop and pay attention to that and know when we ask Jesus to get out of our lives, he oftentimes complies. So we need to use real caution with that. Begin reading with me in chapter 9. And getting into a boat, Jesus crosses over and, excuse me, crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? 
Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or rise and walk? But so that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, and then Jesus interrupts himself and he turns to the paralytic and says, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and went home. And when the crowd saw it, they were afraid and they glorified God who'd given authority to men. All right, we're in Capernaum now, and you may remember Capernaum is sort of considered Jesus' hometown, and people do flock to him there to see what he's doing. They flock so much that some of these ill people seeking a miracle can't even get close to Jesus. We know because this same instance is described in Luke and in Mark that these friends who are bringing their their paralyzed friends to Jesus, they're pretty ingenious. They can't get close enough to Jesus, so they go to the home where Jesus is teaching. They climb up on the roof. They remove the roof tiles, and they lower their buddy down through the roof, and they literally lay him at the feet of Jesus. It's a really beautiful picture of the friend's faith, and Jesus notices it. I don't want you to read over that so quickly you don't notice. Jesus sees their faith, and he's moved by it. Well, they're all expecting a grand miracle. That's what they've come out to see. They expect Jesus to say, rise and walk, and he shocks them by saying something totally different now. He says, your sins are forgiven. So let's talk about Jewish understanding of sin and illness for a moment. There was a Jewish belief that illness was always a direct result of sin in a person's life. So they would believe that you couldn't be healed unless your sin was forgiven. This wasn't necessarily true. That wasn't always the reason people were ill, but it was believed. And so Jesus really plays on that idea to deliberately shift the emphasis now. In his ministry, he shifts the emphasis from physical needs to spiritual needs. That's totally what he's doing, and he's addressing this man's spiritual need by proclaiming that his sins were forgiven. Well, this brings the charge of blasphemy from from the scribes. To blaspheme was to speak for God, to speak against God. It was the most serious offense. And, And the Jews were making this claim of blasphemy because they understood all sin was an offense to a holy, righteous God. All sin was ultimately sin against God, and because he was the only one holy and righteous, he's the only one who can forgive sins. And that is true. We agree with them on that. So when they see Jesus proclaiming forgiveness for sins, they say, he's acting like God. He's stepping into authority that is not his. And that brings this charge of blasphemy here. So Jesus responds to their charge with sort of a rhetorical question. He says, well, it's actually easier for me to say your sins are forgiven because there's no visible sign or proof to show whether I'm right or wrong. But in order to prove I have the authority to do this, and he turns to the paralyzed man and he says, now I'll give you the miracle. Because remember the miracle, the healing, it was a sign. And he tells the young man, rise and walk, and the miracle happens. We have this measurable proof that Jesus has authority to forgive sins. It was one of the most significant signs. It displayed Jesus' authority over sin, and it displayed his real mission. He has compassion for people, but he didn't come to heal diseases. He came to forgive sins. You remember what the angel said to Joseph back in Matthew 121? He's telling him that Mary is with this child and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. This is why Jesus came. So now let's look at all of these miracles together because that's what Matthew wants us to do and ask the question, who is this man? He has power and authority over disease, disability, Satan, demons, nature, and the consequences of sin. That's a lot of power and authority. All those forces must submit to Jesus whenever Jesus commands it. And in spite of all that power and authority, he doesn't force men to submit to him. He gives men freedom. He gives them a choice. And we see in Matthew, some make the right choice and some make the wrong choice. This was unlike any kingdom they'd ever experienced before. You know, you have to remember, they were occupied by Rome at this time. They understood a king who came in and conquered a territory and marked it off and forced all the people inside that territory to comply to the wishes of the king, to bend their knee and submit to them. Jesus is doing something different. He's marking off a territory, and he's inviting people to step into it. And they would step into it based on faith, 
by faith, I'll step into your territory, Jesus. And then by faith, I will voluntarily submit to you. I'll bend my knee to you. I'll prioritize the things that you care about. Submission is something that we can choose when we respond to Jesus appropriately. I'm going to paraphrase a little quickly um, this next section here. Um, because Jesus has just shown them he has the authority to forgive sins, um, sort of to make his point. He calls out a notorious sinner and asks him to be a follower, not just a distant follower, but a disciple, a close follower. He calls Matthew, the tax collector and the author of our gospel. Now, you probably remember we talked a lot about Matthew week one. Deb gave us a great overview of him. Most likely, Matthew was sitting right there on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. He was taking customs taxes for some of those um, ships businesses. Again, read like you're a Jewish audience, a tax collector was despised. They were universally hated, partly because they participated with these Roman occupiers and partly because they had a reputation for um, extracting more taxes than were actually required and lining their own pockets with it. Tax collectors, just like lepers and Gentiles and sick people, they were unclean. The Jews considered them defiled. They were barred from the synagogue. So obviously a tax collector wouldn't have a lot of um, Orthodox Jewish upright friends. So when a tax collector hosts a party or a dinner in his home, he's going to invite his friends. Jesus is among his friends and a bunch of other tax collectors and a bunch of other notorious sinners. So Jesus goes to this dinner in the home of Matthew and immediately um, Jesus is charged with another offense. Why does he hang out with sinners, the religious leaders ask? This is a charge of immorality, suggesting if Jesus hangs out with sinners, he must be a sinner too. I want you to read his rather stinging answer in verse 12 of chapter 9. Why do you hang out with sinners? He says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I came not to call the righteous. I came to call sinners. So here we see Jesus demonstrating mercy and grace, reminding them the sick ones are the ones who need a physician. That's why they're there. Here's what's not quite so obvious. Um, all sinners are spiritually sick. Every single sinner, it's a sickness in our soul and it separates us from God. And ex instead of excluding people because of their sin, Jesus is graciously dealing with their sins so that they can be included. Jesus knows what the Pharisees don't. Every single one of us has soul sickness. No one is good enough for God's holy standards. And then Jesus criticizes the Pharisees. He says, go learn what this means. That sounds rather flippant. That was a harsh statement. He's saying, you um, teachers of the law, you leaders of the law, you perfectors of the law, maybe you need to go study the law just a little bit. Let me remind you what the law says in Hosea. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, not your perfection of these practices that you're doing. I desire mercy. And Jesus had already explained in the Beatitudes, the merciful are the ones who would have a place in the kingdom of God. Mercy was those who can be generous in their spirit, forgiving, those who have compassion both for suffering and compassion for sinners. Because God is merciful, Jesus came to bring his mercy to us. But he can only bring it to the people who think they need mercy. And the Pharisees, these religious leaders, they've so perfected their religious performance, they've lost sight of the fact that they need mercy, and they've lost the ability to show mercy to others. Unfortunately, they are unteachable. But here's what you'll see as Jesus carries out his mission. He will always demonstrate mercy over merit, love over traditions, relationships over rituals. Jesus came to bring mercy and grace to those who know they need it. We get another criticism to Jesus here, and it comes from kind of a disappointing source. The followers of John the Baptist now come to Jesus, and they criticize him. Theirs is a criticism that he lacks piety. 
He isn't fasting. Why aren't you fasting, Jesus? Remember, we talked about this last time, giving to the needy, praying, and fasting. These were the great works of Jewish religious life. God commends each one of these things when we do it with the right motives. We already learned last week the Pharisees had sort of turned their fasting into a public spectacle. Now, John's disciples had fasted, and they'd fasted appropriately. They'd fasted out of repentance, hearts that were grieved for their sin, anxious, for the Messiah to come save them. They'd fasted. And so now they're asking Jesus, why don't you fast and do these spiritual things that we do? And Jesus answers and says, at a wedding, who fasts in the presence of the bridegroom? A Jewish audience totally understood bridegroom as a reference to the Messiah. The wedding is a, refer- is a reference to all these people being brought into fellowship with God. At a wedding, there's joy and celebrating. There's not grief and fasting. He goes on to give them a visual word picture to explain, I'm doing something new here. Don't expect it to be like the old. He says, you won't sew um, a new patch of unshrunk fabric on old shrunken up material. You wouldn't do that because when you wash it, the, the new will tear away from the old. And he says the same thing about wine. You don't put wine, young wine that's fermenting and bubbling and expanding, you don't put it in old, non-elastic wineskins, for it will burst and they'll all be ruined. He's saying you don't take old traditions, some which have been distorted and perverted, you don't bring them all into the new kingdom. Jesus is doing something new. He's going to put an end to some of the Jewish traditions. Some things would stop because Jesus fulfills them, like the sacrificial system. Other things would need to be totally reoriented because they've been corrupted. Jesus is telling them we're doing something new here. Then Matthew goes on and he describes four more miracles. As we look at these, I want you to recognize they are miracles of restoration. They clearly show Jesus restores all things. In verse 18, he begins, While Jesus was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter's just died. Come and lay your hands on her, and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. And behold, a woman who'd suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, If I only touch his garment, I'll be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly she was made well. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, go away, the girl is not dead but sleeping. They laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, Jesus went in and took her by the hand and the girl rose. And the report of this went through all the district. All right, there's so many miracles, one gets interrupted by another. A ruler comes in and asks Jesus to heal his daughter. We know from the other Gospels, he was a ruler, a leader of the synagogue. So this is encouraging. We have a Jewish person expressing great faith in Jesus here. Notice he too isn't asking a question. He's proclaiming faith. If you'll lay your hand on her, Jesus, she'll be made well. And compassionate Jesus immediately agrees and follows him to their home. But on the way, he's interrupted by this woman, a woman who's been ill for 12 years, who just reaches out to get some power off the edge of Jesus' clothes. Here's what you need to remember. Jewish custom rendered a woman who was hemorrhaging unclean. And this woman had been hemorrhaging for 12 years, cast out of her Jewish society for 12 years, unable to worship and fellowship. Just like the leper, she was probably terminally ill, and just like the leper, she was isolated. But her faith is great. She knows healing power comes from Jesus, and she just reaches out to touch him. Immediately, it tells us she's restored to health. But Jesus doesn't rush on to the next miracle. He stops He looks her in the face, he makes eye contact with her, he commends her faith, and he calls her daughter. And I think when he calls her daughter, he's reminding her, you are not isolated. You're part of the kingdom of God, the household of God here. Then he goes on to the ruler's home. The little daughter has died. That's why those flute players are there. They're part of the formal mourning process. He takes the girl by the hand, and he restores her life. And the Jewish people haven't seen this in their lifetime before, but maybe they recall they've heard of it. You know, they honored the law and the prophets. And they do have this instance of the prophet Elijah 
seven or eight hundred years before restoring life to someone, and they, they perhaps understood that was God's sign showing that the prophet was God's man and it was God's message. They'd accepted that as proof in the past that the prophets were sent from God. Would they accept this as proof today that Jesus was sent from God? It doesn't tell us they did. It tells us they talked about it, and word spread everywhere. So I'm going to paraphrase these last two miracles very quickly. Jesus leaves there, and he immediately encounters two blind men. They're following him around, crying out, Son of David, have mercy. Son of David, have mercy. You may remember from week one, Son of David, we talked about this. This is um, a, a term reserved for those who fell in the family line of King David, the great king of Israel. And Son of David is used by people who are expectant and waiting and hoping for the Messiah. So when they call out to Jesus this way, they too are proclaiming faith. Not just faith that Jesus can heal them, but faith that he is the long-awaited Messiah. Jesus immediately responds to their faith and restores their sight. And immediately after that, another demon-possessed man is brought to Jesus. He doesn't have the ability to speak. And so when Jesus casts that demon out, the man's ability to speak is restored. So Matthew wants you to look at these miracles all together and ask, who is this man? He's the one who came to restore everything. He restores health and life and sight. That's what Matthew wants you to see. He begins by restoring spiritual life to all of us who believe. He wants to save us from the spiritual death that we deserve. He wants to restore us to a right relationship with God. I think he's probably wanting them to remember the words of the prophet Isaiah. From Isaiah 35, he says, The Lord will come, and then the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. They have beheld it all. And how do they respond? Look at verse 33. And the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He cast out demons by the prince of demons. So we see two responses here, some wonder and marvel, some oppose and accuse. If you've looked at all of it, you cannot argue that he's all-powerful, and yet he doesn't overpower men, does he? He lets us behold, and he invites us to believe. So looking at all of this, what is the appropriate response to seeing this with our eyes? The only response is to follow him. We don't stay on the sidelines marveling and talking. We don't oppose him. We certainly don't beg him to leave. Instead, we follow him because he is always moving towards restoration. He's restoring what's broken, beginning with our broken relationship with God. Every one of us is diseased by sin. For every one of us, Jesus offers that his work on the cross could bring us forgiveness and restore us to God. But that's just the entry point. That's just the moment when you step into the kingdom, and there's so much more. I don't think we need to think that it's possible to stop there. We keep following him. Once we behold who he is, we keep following every day because he wants to keep restoring us. And what do you think he's restoring? We were made in the image of God. But sin, it mars and distorts that image. God wants to keep restoring us every day so that we start reflecting his image more and more. That's what he's all about, and he will do it if in faith we keep following him. I don't know if you noticed in these miracles how often Jesus noticed their faith. He noticed the Gentile centurion. He noticed the friends of the paralyzed man. He noticed the woman who reached out. Jesus notices. He's pleased. He responds. It delights him when we demonstrate faith. Demonstrating faith, it invites Jesus' presence. It invites his restorative work. It invites peace, and it invites joy into our lives. Matthew puts all these miracles together so we can behold and respond. I think he's thinking of the words of Isaiah 25. Listen to this. The Lord will come. It will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We've waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord we've waited for. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Let's pray. God, you're good. You have sent us your son. And we just praise you that he has made a way for us to be in sweet fellowship with you and sweet fellowship with each other. 
We praise you um, that you've given us all these signs so that we can believe, Lord. To those who haven't stepped into your kingdom yet, I pray that they would look at it all clearly and bend their knee and submit to Jesus and receive eternal life. For the rest of us, help us keep following, Lord. Help us just pursue you in faith so that we too can continually be restored every day. We ask this thing in the powerful, mighty name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen.